We're just going to talk about the different things that Darren has in this mix out here. This is a grazing mix. It's been growing for about eight weeks. It was planted about the middle of June. Uh, the, the history here, there's no added fertility here. The, what you're seeing is just no fertilizer, uh, no herbicides. He had a similar mix here last year that they would have grazed with the poultry and the sheep. So there's a lot of nutrients being cycled from the past years. So he would have grazed out a mix similar to this, had cereal rye over the winter. He probably grazed it some through the spring and then he would have planted this mix right back in here in June again. So uh, this is just a, a continuous grazing cycle. So he's doing great things to the soil uh, because of just having all of the animals out here and, not, and, and a variety of animals too, you know, the chickens, the turkeys, the sheep. He has very similar mixes to this so that, that he's running cattle on as well. I don't know that he runs cattle here because he kind of saves the stuff close to the house for the poultry. So there's, there's about 12 or 15 different things out here. We'll kind of point out some of them. If you see something that you don't know what it is, make sure you ask so that we get those questions answered. Um, a mix like this, uh, people always ask, what would this mix cost? Uh, you know, 25 to $30 an acre is probably the seed cost on this mix right here. Uh, this, this was probably planted at a rate of uh, probably around 30 pounds an acre. This is, this is really thick. Uh, I think he planted it really thick where he has a poultry because with poultry you want finer stems, shorter plants, it's going to be easier for them to graze. I would say this mix probably could have been cut, the seeding rate could have been cut back by 15 or 20 percent if he was doing cattle on this because cattle will have the ability to utilize the larger stock. So just pointing out a few of the things that are in here, uh, this, this tall plant right here is sun hemp. Uh, every, most everything that's out here is going to be all warm season stuff because it was planted in June. There are a few brassicas, if you look really closely, they're kind of down close to the bottom. They're not doing real well because they're pretty heavily shaded. It's been pretty hot the last two months. So they don't really like that environment. If they can survive, they'll do pretty good after this other stuff freezes out. We generally don't put a lot of brassicas in June mixes. If this was being planted more around the 1st of August, we would put a lot more brassicas in and even some oats and peas and things like that. But planted in June, primarily warm season stuff. Sun hemp, uh, tropical legume, loves the heat. You guys, as hot as you guys get, it is not too hot for sun hemp. Uh, very aggressive producer of nitrogen, uh, very high protein in the leaves. Uh, the animals will pick these leaves off and eat them. It's a great protein supplement. Uh, I would not graze a solid stand of sun hemp without really, really watching the management because it can be pretty hot, uh, you know, nutrient-wise. Uh, there are some <laughs> types of sun hemp that have high alkaloids as well, and so there's some articles out there saying you should never graze sun hemp. We've never had an issue with it when you have just, you know, two, three pounds an acre in a mix. So that's a really good plant for planting into the heat. Uh, you'll see some of these uh, large leaf plants like, like this. There's both, there's both, he's got both cow peas and mung beans out here. Uh, I think this is a mung bean. It's a shorter statured type plant. Uh, the cow peas are much uh, vinier. And if you look like right here, those things are just vining right up these plants. And uh, they're both, again, warm season legumes. They love the heat. They can produce a lot of nitrogen in a fairly short period of time. Very high in protein again, very palatable for the animals. So sun hemp, cow peas, and mung beans are really kind of the staple warm season legumes that we'll use in a lot of, of these types of mixes. Uh, there's a lot of sorghum sedan out here because sorghum uh, is a very high tonnage producer. He's gonna get the bulk of the tonnage of grazing out here with this sorghum. If you look at the sorghum, this is a what we call a brown midrib sorghum. And if you look right down this middle rib of the leaf, it is very dark, very brown. And when you see that, you know that this has the brown midrib or the BMR gene. And what that means is this plant has less lignin than a regular sorghum plant. And what that means is it's much more uh, digestible and much more palatable for cattle. So they will preferentially eat this as compared to a non-brown rib, mid-rib variety. They can also digest it and utilize a higher percentage of the nutrients in this. It's a little more expensive, 
uh, but you know, for you know the 20 or 30 cents a pound extra that it costs, it's definitely worth it if you're grazing livestock. If you're not grazing livestock, there's no advantage to it from a soil health standpoint. I would use the non-brown midrib varieties and save a little money. But if you got cattle uh, or any type of livestock, the brown midrib is definitely the way to go. Now he's also got brown midrib corn. And this is a, uh, again, this is specifically designed for grazing. It, the brown, it's not quite as dark, but it's definitely darker than normal corn. Uh, this is a, a, an 84 day corn uh, that is extremely palatable. And when I was talking to Darren earlier, if he would turn cattle out in here, they would kind of browse around, but the first thing that they would eat, they would find these corn plants, they would eat them all the way to the ground, and then they'd worry about the rest. There's something about this corn that is incredibly palatable, and they will find this, and they will just literally eat that down right to the roots, and then they'll worry about the rest. Uh, it's open pollinated seed, so it's pretty cheap, uh, so we really like it. You can see it doesn't get real big. It's not going to put on very big ears, but this is the perfect time to graze this because we're. this is not a grain corn. Do not plant this if you want to grow grain corn. This is a grazing corn, and it's a very, very palatable very inexpensive grazing corn to use, so it fits in really well with what he's doing here. Somebody already identified this plant for me. Okay, this is okra. We have started using okra in our cover crop mixes the last several years uh, for several reasons. The characteristics that we really like about it, it's very heat tolerant, it's very drought tolerant, it's got a really nice root system, and it's a, it's a pretty tough, fibrous, very high carbon stock. And once you start doing the soil health type farming, one of the things that you'll find pretty quickly is that it's hard to keep the soil covered because your biological activity of your soil is ramped up so much that it just consumes all the residue you can throw out there. So when that starts happening, and that'll start happening probably about three years after you've been into a system like this, you'll just start seeing way too much bare soil for what you'd like. So you need to shift to a higher carbon nitrogen ratio in your cover crop mix. And so plants like okra, plants like sunflowers can help do that because there's a lot of carbon in this stem. Now the cattle will eat the leaves off of this very well. This one is just getting ready to start blooming right here. After it blooms, it'll form that, that okra fruit. You know, you've seen pickled okra or you know, you can cut it up and fry it. And this is the same stuff you plant in your garden. This is Clemson Spineless 80. Uh, so you can actually come out here and harvest okra if you like to eat it, but you got to beat the cattle to it because they'll pick that fruit off and they'll eat it quite readily. They'll eat the leaves, but they'll leave the stalks. And uh, we like that because, you know, the okra stalks, the sunflower stalks, even these sorghum stalks, they'll strip these leaves off. If you don't graze it too hard, they'll leave a lot of the stalk. They will not leave this corn stalk. They'll completely eat that. But we want some stuff left standing to catch snow. Uh, to, to have higher carbon to lay down for the microbes to digest. This is, could you broadcast this and then try to incorporate it with like a rotary hoe or a harrow or something like that? That would work if you have fairly loose, fairly tilled soil where he was no-tilling this into grazed out rye or sprayed out rye. It would be really difficult to get the seed to soil contact that you would want for that. Uh, this was all mixed together, large seeds, small seeds, all seeds. 95% of the people we sell seed to only have a one box drill. We mix it together, you put it in, you'll get a little separation, but it's very minimal and, and it's not gonna be a big deal. Uh, we can keep seed separate if you've got that ability. And, and again, he didn't have a lot of super small seed in here, very minimal amount of brassicas. There's a little bit of some uh, Japanese millet out here. But other than that, most of these seeds were a little large. We encourage people, don't fill your drill all the way up because seed separation will occur over a matter of time. So put in what you can drill out in an hour and then just stop and fill more often. And you'll, you'll really kind of limit how much separation that you'll get on that. The, the more diversity that you have, the less separation you'll get. If all you're planting is soybeans and turnips, those will separate really fast. You got nothing to hold it together. Throw a little oats in there, throw in some buckwheat, different shapes, different sizes, it ties things together pretty well. Uh, this is buckwheat. Buckwheat is a plant that we really like to include in our mixes. Grows extremely fast, blooms extremely fast. This one is kind of on the tail end of its blooming, but this has been blooming probably for five weeks. Uh, this stuff will start blooming in about three weeks after you plant it. 
uh, and then it will start producing viable seed after about uh, seven to eight weeks. Uh, buckwheat has a, the, the roots of the buckwheat exude a uh, kind of a unique acid that allows it to access phosphorus in the soil that other plants cannot get to. And so it almost acts as a, you know, biology can get to that phosphorus, but buckwheat's one of the few plants that can access some of that phosphorus that other plants can't. So then when it brings it into the plant, and either a, uh, an animal eats this and cycles it through, or this just dies and decomposes, the phosphorus that this plant has in it now is in a form that other plants can utilize. So we really like buckwheat to help make phosphorus more available. Now, he's just got one or two pounds of buckwheat in here. It's not going to make a significant difference. But if you've got fields that you really want to do some phosphorus work on, you can plant this at a much higher rate. You would have to cut back on other things, though. So you really have to know what are your goals. Darren's goal is not to make phosphorus available here because he's got the system cycling so well he doesn't need to. But if it's the first year doing it, I would recommend you go a lot higher rates of, of buckwheat initially. It's, it's fairly inexpensive, it grows really fast, it competes with weeds very well, frost kills it, uh, and I've never heard anybody say that it's been an issue to spray out, uh, you know, because you will have volunteer buckwheat. You put buckwheat in a mix, it's going to make seeds. 